Believers need to remain diligent in avoiding immorality because it only brings trouble. Today, Pastor Lemming continues in his series, Dear Paul. When I come to the pulpit, I always come with too much material for any one service. Have you noticed that? Uh, I always have more than you can ever really uh, disseminate in a single lesson or a single message. Most of the time, what I try to do is I try to truncate some of those various things that are in the message so that I can keep it to a reasonable length. But this particular week, as I have been studying a passage of Scripture from 1 Corinthians chapter 6, where we are studying every Sunday morning, uh, I realized that there is too much material here for me to cover in, in one Sunday. And so while I brought all of my notes for all of the message, uh, we're going to break it into two parts this week and next week, because what I have to say to you is so applicable to uh, the 21st century modern American society that I don't want us to miss it. And those that aren't here today to hear it, those that aren't going to be able to, to listen to it, live streaming it, or not going to be able to listen to it online later on, I hope that at some point they'll come back and they'll hear this first message and connect it with the second message that will come next week, and they will see the importance of these two messages coming together. So let's bow our heads together for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, I do pray for our, our church family that are traveling. We have a good number of people that are on the road, and we pray for their restful time. We pray for them to enjoy uh, the time away for our children, our young people, our college students that have uh, spring break. We pray for safety. We pray for wise decisions. We pray, Lord, that they will return to us uh, seeking you and desiring you, that they will return to us refreshed. Uh, from their time away. But Lord, we're here in your presence. These that have come to this early worship service, we're here to honor you and to glorify you. And the subject matter, again, is somewhat uncomfortable. It is absolutely important. And in a day when too few churches are saying any of these things, Lord, we're not going to be a church that shies away from the passages of Scripture that sometimes make us uncomfortable. Every word of Scripture is inspired. Every part of Scripture is valuable. And I pray, Lord, today that you'll help us to hear what you're saying to us. Let us not be distracted by the things of this world. But, Lord, let us hear your voice speaking through your word. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. During the course of a week, any particular week, I have a routine that I go through in the morning. Most of you probably have a routine that you follow, unless you've got young children, and then every day the routine is different probably for you. But I have a routine that I follow, things that I like to do in the order that I always do them. That's just the way I am. Part of that routine is to open a couple of apps that are on my electronic devices and to look at the news uh, from the past day or two and what they're expecting for the day to come. Uh, this past week, I opened my, one of my apps, and I was looking at the news, and an article caught my attention. It was an opinion piece, it's an opinion piece, written by a medical doctor. And this particular doctor was expressing in this piece his concern for the spring breakers that were traveling to the various places across the country and maybe even uh, around the world. As I read through the article, it was interesting because ultimately what he was concerned about, the, the, the greatest uh, uh, caution that he was offering in the article related to the matter of drugs and how available drugs are and how dangerous those drugs are and how today uh, something that you think contains one thing can actually contain something else. Something that you think is one particular drug may have fentanyl, for instance, that's mixed into it, and how those drugs can literally take the lives of young people as they're taking them. And of course, I concur with that great concern. But in the opening paragraph of, of this particular article, that this is what the medical doctor said. A teenager I know very well 
is heading south to the beaches for spring break this week, equipped with a toothbrush, clothes, and then a particular form of birth control that I'm not going to mention here for the decorum of this service, and something new, a Narcan inhaler. Now, what caught my attention because of what I've been studying in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 was how he just sort of moved quickly across the birth control that these young people were taking with them, intending and anticipating that they were going to involve themselves in various sexual activities while they were on spring break. That interested me, so I began looking at statistics related to spring break. And I came across an article from uh, this past year, and this is what it says. Spring break typically involves college students dressed in bathing suits, heavy alcohol use, wild dancing, and unprotected sex. A past survey given to female college students regarding spring break activities indicated that approximately half of the respondents were drunk all day during spring break. And approximately 40% drank until they passed out while a similar study of men showed even higher numbers. Additionally, in a survey of of female spring breakers, 74% said that spring break involved increased sexual activity compared to normal campus college life. Listen to that phrase. 74% said that spring break involved increased sexual activity compared to normal campus college life, while 57% indicated that being sexually promiscuous during spring break was viewed as an acceptable way to fit in. Promiscuous behavior is viewed as an acceptable way to fit in. One half of sexual encounters were random and unplanned, and again, one half of sexual encounters were unprotected. I don't mean to suggest that all spring breakers are doing this. There are a lot of spring breakers, some of which I know, that go away for a spring break and they don't involve themselves in any of this kind of behavior, any of this kind of conduct. And I'm very grateful. Actually, I I know some spring breakers this year that use their spring break and are using their spring break to be involved in some kind of a missional event, some kind of a a mission where they've gone to serve other people. And I want to say thank you and congratulations to those of you that are spring breakers using your time away uh, to be able to help others. I commend you for doing that. So I'm not trying to indict everybody here, but it bothers me and it concerns me that probably amongst this number that are involved in this sexual promiscuity, during spring break are a lot of people who profess to be Christians, a lot of young people who profess to be Christians. Many Christians, unfortunately, are caught up in this immoral culture. And God, I believe, is going to speak to those who are hearing this message today, and they're going to hear what God has to say about this through the Apostle Paul writing to the Corinthians where they were living in one of the most promiscuous ages that has ever existed. I want you to follow along with me, beginning in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, at verse 12 down to verse 20. And listen carefully to what it says. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Foods for the stomach and the stomach for foods, but God will destroy both it and them. Now the body is not for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. And God both raised up the Lord and will also raise us up by his power. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ? Shall I take the members of Christ and make them members of a harlot? Certainly not. Or do you not know that he who is joined to a harlot is one body with her? For the two, he says, shall become one flesh. But he who is joined to the Lord is one spirit with him. Flee sexual immorality. 
Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not your own? For you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body or in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Now, before you get too far away from these verses that I've read to you, I want you to notice some words that are repeated so that you don't miss them, because these, these are very important words. You will discover in this text that eight times in eight verses, eight times in eight verses, he uses the word body or bodies. You see it at the end of verse 13. Now, the body. It, the, uh, further down in verse 13 to the very end of the verse, he uses the word body again. In verse 15, the word body. In verse 16, the word body. In verse 18, he uses it twice, the word body. In verse 19, he uses the word body. In verse 20, he uses the word body. I just want to stop here and I want to say to you for a moment that I think it's pretty obvious that he's talking about the the body. He's talking about the physical bodies, the flesh in which you and I live And what we do with these bodies, he's going to tell us, is something that's extremely important. It's not something to be taken lightly. It's something that's extremely important. And if you didn't notice, you should notice how often he uses, it's a single Greek word, but how often he uses this word translated in in my translation as sexual immorality. Just go back again to those verses we read a few moments ago. You notice in verse 13, he says sexual immorality. Down in verse 18, he says sexual immorality. Uh, And then later in verse 18, sexual immorality. As a matter of fact, if you'll just back up in in your reading for a moment to the beginning. Let's go back to the beginning of of chapter 5, verse 1. He uses sexual immorality twice in chapter 5, verse 1. He uses it again in verse 9, sexual immorality. Again in verse 10, he uses it again in verse 11. When you get to chapter 6, you see it in verse 9, fornicators. That's the same Greek word, sexual immorality. He uses that specific, or just, that word's translated specifically as fornicators because it's surrounded by other words like adulterers or homosexuals or sodomites. So he's, he's distinguishing some things there. But that's the word. In other words, nine times in two chapters, he speaks about sexual immorality. And he brings together the body. You got it? He brings together the body and sexual immorality. And he says you're not supposed to be using your body for sexual immorality. Now, It's pretty clear what Paul is saying here. If you look carefully at what he lays out in these verses that we've read this morning, but I'm going to give it to you this week and next week in five very simple statements. I hope that you'll remember these statements. You'll get two of them today. You'll get the other three next week, but I hope that you'll remember these five very simple statements. And I'm making them from the 21st century perspective But they're dealing with the same thing that we're dealing with today, everywhere, all around us, dealing with it on a constant basis where we're using our bodies in sexual immorality and they come together. And the Apostle Paul is saying that's not the way a believer in Jesus Christ is supposed to behave. First statement, in the realm of morality, in the realm of morality, ignorance is not always bliss. In the realm of morality, ignorance is not always bliss. You, you've heard that phrase, haven't you? Ignorance is bliss. And there's a lot of things where I think that's probably true. Ignorance is bliss. A number of years ago, I um, wanted to see and try to understand how a cremation took place. I didn't want to ask my friends at the funeral homes who do these things. I just I didn't want to have to be there when it was happening. I wanted to be able to look in through a camera lens and be able to see what was going on. And so I Googled it. 
How do, how do they do cremations of a human body? And it brought me up to several different YouTube videos, and I didn't watch them all. I watched a couple of them. It was all I needed to see, to see how they went about cremating a body. Now, I'm not saying that cremation of the body is wrong. I'm just telling you that when I watched that video, I got more information than I really wanted to have, number one. And second of all, it left me very disturbed by what I was watching and what I was seeing. On one of the videos, they showed you know, brief clips of a cremation that was actually taking place at different times during the course of the cremation. And for me, that was TMI. That was too much information. The same can be said when it comes to the medical aspect of a person's life. I've been visiting the hospitals my entire adult life. I've made thousands of hospital visits. I don't make as many today as I used to, but I've made thousands of hospital visits. And if you ever go visit somebody in the hospital and you sit down, as pastors do, and you begin talking about the, with the person about the, you know, what's going on in their bodies and what, what they're doing here in the hospital and what, what's going to happen or what has happened, they'll begin telling you details. Details that really I didn't need to know and probably shouldn't have asked to know. And there's some questions I don't ask at all because I don't want to know the answer. But in the process of, of all of the years of going to hospital rooms and listening to people talk about what was done or what they're planning to do, it was just TMI. I mean, it was just too much information because now I think if I ever have to have that done, I'll be a nervous wreck until it's, until it's over and I'm healed and I'm back on my feet. I don't want to know that much information. There's, a, there's some things in life where ignorance is bliss. You don't have to know, and it's okay that you don't know. But when it comes to the realm of morality, ignorance is not bliss. I don't know if you saw this or not, but I'm going to take you back here to the text. We're looking at these, these first two points from a 30,000-foot view of what's going on here. But, but I want you to look at the phrasing that he uses in verse 15. Do you not know? Will you look down with me uh, to verse 16? Or do you not know? Or you come down to verse 19. Or do you not know? And if that's not enough for you, just back up with me for a moment. Just back up with me for a moment. Look at chapter 5 again, verse 6. He says, your glory is not good. Do you not know? Chapter 6, verse 2. Do you not know? Verse 3. Do you not know? Verse 9. Do you not know? Of the 10 times that phrase is found in 1 Corinthians, eight of them, excuse me, nine of them are in chapter 6 and 7. Excuse me, chapters 5 and 6. I'll get these right in a minute. Are in chapters 5 and 6. In other words, the crescendo, you find two more of them a little bit later in the epistle. But in, in, in these two chapters, you find all of these that are jammed in here together. Seven times in these two chapters. Jammed in here together. Don't you know? Don't you know? You know, I would assume that there are people who are new believers who didn't grow up in a church and maybe were abused by their parents or were taught a completely different morality by their parents or who were educated in a morality by the world. I could assume that there are people that, you know, early on in their spiritual lives don't know enough of the Bible. They haven't been around Christian people long enough. They, they, they haven't had enough interaction with other believers. They haven't had their consciences yet come fully alive and that, so that the conviction of the Spirit of God can do its work in, in our hearts. And, and there, there's this whole matter of, of there can be some people who don't know. They just haven't been taught. They just are ignorant of the facts. But Paul is writing to people. He had spent 18 months himself in the city of Corinth. 
They had Apollos, who the scripture says was mighty in the scriptures. They had Peter, who was one of the boldest preachers you'd ever hear. They had the teachings of Jesus himself and what Jesus taught on subjects like this. And Paul comes to them and he says, don't you know this stuff? Don't you get it? How is it that you say you don't know it? And the fact of the matter is, I think they did know it. Just like modern day American Christians know it, they just ignore it. They know it, but they ignore it. And Paul comes and he says, how can you not know this about what is biblical morality? What is spiritual morality? What is morality as it relates to your what? Your body, how you use your body. How can you not know what is moral in the use of your body? And unless you're a brand new Christian, you're a young believer in Jesus, you had parents that just didn't teach you anything, and you were educated in an amoral educational system that just taught you the biology of something but didn't teach you the morality of it. The fact of the matter is there isn't anybody who doesn't have some inkling of an idea that this kind of conduct and this kind of behavior is unacceptable for Christians to be using their body for the purpose of sexual immorality. Do you not know? He reaches this crescendo. You can almost feel the frustration that the Apostle Paul is is expressing here. Don't you know? How is it that you don't know that using your body in this way is a sin against God? It's inappropriate. It's improper. God's not pleased with it. You need to repent of it. You need to turn to the Lord. How is it you don't know that? How is it that we don't know that? Except that our churches have gone silent when it comes to the matter of sexual morality and we no longer discipline sexual immorality. And the result is we have generations that are growing up who have little concept of what it means to be sexually pure in the course of living out their lives. If I were to put it in 21st century terminology, it would go something like this. Do you not know that flirting at the office can lead to immoral behavior? Do you not know that watching sexually explicit movies defiles your soul? Do you not know that pornography is harmful to your walk with God? Do you not know that traveling alone with someone that is not your spouse looks bad and leads to sexual temptation? Do you not know that the music you sing often becomes the values you embrace? Do you not know that the books you read become the thoughts you think? Do you not know that your children are daily being bombarded with sexually explicit images and music? Do you not know that your young people are being indoctrinated every single day by the media they watch? Do you not know that their cell phones are being used by some for sexting? Do you not know that some of your children's friends are the ones introducing them to sexually explicit materials? Do you not know that Hollywood has no respect for biblical and moral values? Do you not know that some in our schools are determined to shape our children immorally? Do you not know that our children are constantly being taught to accept sexual perversity? Do you not know that any sexual activity outside of marriage is is sinful. So that brings me to these four statements. Number one, come to Jesus and let him forgive you. You say, I've been looking at things and talking to people in ways I shouldn't talk, and I've been listening to things, and I've been reading things, and I've been watching things. Hey, look, some of you got streaming TV. We got streaming TV. But you can't control it, and your kids don't control it. And they're seeing things, and you're seeing things, and you need to come to Jesus, and you need to say, oh, God, forgive me. 
Oh, God, forgive me. I'm not supposed to be letting my body, whether it's my mind or some other aspect of my body, be involved in things that are sexually immoral. Number two, leave here to walk in purity of heart and mind. And let me just tell you, it is going to be one challenge every single day of your life. You don't even have to be looking for it if you're searching on the internet. They will see to it that you find what they want you to see. Young people, college students, adults, leave here to walk in purity of heart. Oh, I just got to give this. I got to give this to you. Listen to what Job said. Job 31, verse 1. I have made a covenant with my eyes. Why then should I look upon a young woman? You know what Job said? I make a covenant with my mind. I make a covenant with my eyes. I make a covenant with my ears. I make a covenant with my hands and my feet and my body. I make a covenant that I'm going to keep myself pure in heart and in mind. Number three, commit to teaching your children biblical morality. Sometimes when I teach from this pulpit, I feel like an old man. Because I still believe what the Bible says is true for me and is true for you and there's to be no compromise of it. And I've heard it once, I've heard it several times. You're just a different generation. That's true. I'm a different generation. I'm a different generation. But this book is the inspired, inerrant, infallible word of the living God for every generation. Period. And number four, hear me carefully. Number four, seek help if you're unable to break the cycle of immoral addiction. Seek help if you're unable to break the cycle of immoral addiction. You don't have to live under its authority. Jesus can set you free. Thanks for joining with us today, and we hope this message made a difference for you. If you'd like more information about today's message or Lewis Memorial Baptist Church, feel free to contact us. We'd love to hear how this ministry is helping you in your daily walk.